Hi everyone, Dr. Dan Lawrence here. So this video is to provide some context on Marshall McLuhan, the famous media theorist from the 20th century, probably the first media theorist too. Um, McLuhan is initially a professor of English and branches out his writing and his thinking to cover a, what some scholars call a kind of prophetic vision of technology and media in the mid 20th century. Not literally a prophet, not literally prophetic, but seemed, McLuhan seemed to anticipate a lot of the issues that we would have with technology by way of observing what was going on in his own time with the advent of mass communication, you know, writing. Let's, the, the excerpt we're reading from the medium is the massage or message is from 1967. So he's doing his thinking, um, you know, think about um, even Hitler's use of mass communication in, in World War II demonstrates the kind of horrific power that mass communication can have. This is just a, you know, this is in the same kind of contemporaneous time period that McLuhan is thinking. And then in the post-World War II boom, um, you know, television sets in every American household, he's seeing a, a dramatic radical shift in the media environment in the same way that now we have our parallel shift every American with a smartphone or, you know, nearly every, nearly every American citizen with a smartphone. And of course that's right. Rip, ripple. There's the ripple across the entire world. So McLuhan, I think the right way to preface McLuhan is by saying, you know, there were many critiques of his work and he still remains a kind of controversial figure, but still regarded as a, like almost a, a necessary seminal thinker in the development of media theory for the visionary and seminal work that he did. The largest, the biggest critiques from contemporary scholars are twofold, and in the second part of this discussion, we'll get into his major theory by way of critiquing it. So the, the first major critique that we see of McLuhan is that, you know, where is your evidence, basically, buddy? You know, where, what are, where is all this coming from? He's kind of a pure theorist, a pure philosopher, almost in that, in that like ancient Greek tradition of asking big questions. McLuhan is not a scientist, right? So that's the major critique of McLuhan's work is we just wish he would have had you know, data to back up claims. We wish that there was a, a more empirical material, uh, let's say, let's say uh, um, quantitative element to his work. Um, not that a philosopher needs to do that, but, you know, if we're going to base a, a scholarly tradition on, the, on someone's thought, you know, we would want more like compelling Evidence, I guess, is, is the major critique of, of McLuhan that has arisen over the last few decades. And then, of course, many scholars respond to that and say, well, he was a theorist. You know, he's working purely in a philosophical, theoretical, observatory, you know, critical realm. And, and he doesn't, you know, that the, the way to change our perception and mode of thinking in the humanities can be purely theoretical. And then, you know, you in the, the sciences is the realm that deals with qualitative and quantitative studies that then, you know, back up particular positions. Um, that's a fun and messy kind of debate that we could go down. But nonetheless, I wanted to bring that up, right? We're reading a, a famous thinker and there are some serious critiques about his work. So, you know, one, we have McLuhan working in a kind of purely theoretical realm, although you'll see he, you know, he does, um, he points towards evidence, like anecdotal evidence, I, I would say, to support 
Um, but where's his citations, right? 30 million toy trucks were bought in the U.S. in 1966. I wish, you know, we just wish he would have, like, cited that, really, in a kind of basic scholarly way. Okay, the second critique of McLuhan is now we introduce his major theory. This is the, this is the major contribution of McLuhan, is this argument that the medium is the message. And it's almost the title of the book, but rather comically, there's a misprint. They title the book, The Medium is the Massage. But McLuhan really likes this. He likes this typo because media work us over, he, he claims. So it's, it's as if we are being <laughs> massaged by media all the time. So he likes the misprint and he, he lets it stick. But you can see on, what is it, page 9 of the PDF... Yeah, page nine of the of PDF is like where the text begins as we get this really salient primary argument from McLuhan that he echoes in his other work, which is that the medium is the message, the content is incidental. And modern scholars, again, they think this is an important idea, but they tend to disagree with the veracity of, of the claim, but they recognize that it's an important idea. Here's why. So what does this mean? The, the medium is the message. He's saying it, it doesn't so matter, it doesn't matter so much, say, what you are watching on your television or your smartphone. You know, it's, it's the fact that you have a television in your living room and you've restructured everything in your life around the television it doesn't so ma it doesn't matter which television news program you're watching it matters that you are now making your voting choices based on the information that's coming from the system of technology that is the television inside your living room so he's saying that it's the medium it's the technology it's the device that has the more persuasive argument it's the medium itself that is reshaping your life. The actual things they're saying, the programming, the content of the medium is less significant than the medium itself. The same thing with the book. So McLuhan wrote this, this interesting book called The Gutenberg Galaxy in which he kind of, I don't know if we want to say laments, but he he reviews and reflects on the shift from the book-based society to the now auditory society. So it's almost this kind of reversal that we see, right? If we think back, like, um, you know, you have the invention of writing around between two and 3,000 BCE, you know, roughly 4,500 to 5,000 years ago. Before that, the human is a principally oral creature, right? Uh, we, we pass on ideas, stories, mythologies, philosophies through the oral tradition, through epic poetry, through song and music and dance, through this auditory visual way of communicating the oral creature, the oral human, the oral the oral experience of reality. Um, but then we have the invention of writing. And those of you who took 303 with me, we talk quite a bit about this because, you know, Plato offers a critique of writing in Phaedrus. And we think about the ways in which writing would have been a relatively new technology for the ancient Greeks. Um, and they would have pushed back against that. But nonetheless, you know, you have a book-based culture then which has all sorts of ramifications, right? Knowledge can be passed on in the form of the book. Um, religion becomes quite like codified and solidified and cemented in, in artifacts like a Bible, right? Which then has ramifications for societies and culture and civilization for centuries and centuries, millennia really, right? Um, but then now McLuhan is saying we're, we're finally kind of turning the corner on the book-based society where our primary way of 
you know, viewing the world is through text. We are now primarily viewing the world through visual and auditory means again, through the television, now through the internet, through digital media, social media, video. Some have called, for example, you know, some have said that this is kind of like a new, the internet age is a new Gutenberg printing press type of revolution in human communication, that we're, we're again turning the corner, changing the way we interact with the world, moving away from the book-based um, the book based world. And that that's this is a separate argument from say, you know, the decline of the publishing industry or, you know, whether or not you know, um, people still read books. It's it's not it's not like the death of the book or something like that. It's just saying the way that we you know, the, the way that we interact with reality has fundamentally shifted with the invention of television and, you know, film now with the internet and digital media. Okay, so that that's McLuhan in like a really really brief nutshell. It's the me, the medium is primary, the content is secondary. It doesn't so matter for McLuhan. It doesn't matter what you're doing on your smartphone. It's the fact that you have a smartphone. It's it's the fact that you're using it three hours a day or five hours a day, and you're connected to this web of information. You know, and uh, the internet and Wikipedia and this kind of frothing over of, of information and disinformation and you're communicating with people. It doesn't really matter what you're doing on the thing, on the device, on the medium. It's that the medium has already reshaped your life. You're already, you've already changed the way you interact with reality by the very nature of having the smartphone in your hand and in that way media work us over media reshape the way that we interact with reality I, d I did want to keep this really brief and i want you to enjoy the text too so that's just like intro you know super brief introduction to McLuhan to help you think about what does it mean that the medium is the message it's it's the the medium itself, right? So the medium that I'm communicating with you right now is visual and auditory, right? You're getting this kind of YouTube short format YouTube video, but then the big critique comes in. It's like, what do you what do you mean that the content is incidental? That 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 can't be the case, right? That's the major second critique of McLuhan, is it it actually does seem to matter what we watch and what we consume and what we create and the arguments that we, that we make, right? You, if you read an article that is, you know, imagine this scenario, right? A person reads a piece of misinformation, say an opinion piece about coronavirus, right? Versus a person reads a peer-reviewed scientific piece of research about coronavirus. That's very different content that could create a different result in that person's behaviors or understanding of the world. And then that can change, you know, their, their experience of reality in a really immediate, important, physical and material kind of way. So that's the big critique of McLuhan is how could you say that the content doesn't matter? Of course, the content seems to matter, but the medium is also very powerful. So modern scholars, contempt that I mean, contemporary scholars like me, for example, we tend to think that both the medium and the content are persuasive and important and worth thinking about. That's the we've we've taken McLuhan and just adjusted him a little bit, toned him down. But we we understand why he said that. We understand he he said the medium is the message because the medium is so powerful. And he wanted, McLuhan really wanted to call our attention to just how powerful the medium itself can be. Thanks, everybody. Take care of yourselves. Enjoy McLuhan. It's a little wacky, right? It's a little, this, this kind of mixed hybrid multimodal text, you know, with imagery and, and text and ideas. And that's on purpose, too, right? So enjoy very much. Take care.